big idea that I've been charged with introducing you to is the idea of itineration. But first, I want to frame this discussion with a brief quotation from Deleuze Guattari's A Thousand Plateaus, uh, one that I hope provides a formula for the imprecise or inexact itinerary that I'll be following for the next seven to ten minutes of video time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Early in the rise of the chapter, the Luz and Guattari bump up against what they call the <laughs> problem of writing. It's also the problem of speaking. <laughs> and as an aside, I want to add that this, this quotation describes for me what, what I think the, the central problem for the field of rhetoric and composition is. So this is the quote. They say, I can, I can read it. The problem of writing. In order to designate something exactly, Anexact expressions are utterly unavoidable, not at all because they're a necessary step or because one can only advance by approximation. Anexactitude is in no way an approximation. On the contrary, it is the exact passage of that which is underway. In other words, the problem here is how to deploy imprecise expressions in order to precisely re render a kind of movement of becoming, and this is a movement that is not uh, primarily subject to a logic of identity. Um, and I would say, you know, this, this movement um, and its imprecise expression or articulation comprise the whole idea of itineration. And so I really have nothing more to say. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, but maybe we should slow down a bit and re retrace our steps and work through this. This is a question of speeds, of course. So there's nothing else to say, but I'll continue talking. Uh, so for my field, rhetoric, one of the obvious places from which to approach this concept of itineration would be to consider the differences between the itinerant teachers of antiquity and, for instance, the founders of schools. I'm thinking of the sophists of ancient Greece, who were teachers that wandered from town to town selling their services and teaching a variety of different arts, like, like Cain from Kung Fu. Or, in a certain sense, you could say Jesus from the Bible, uh, kind of. But contrast these figures for with, for instance, Plato, Aristotle, or Isocrates, all of whom founded schools in Athens. Or you could take Paul as the founder of Christianity, a school in a, in a metaphorical sense there. So one might pose here a kind of what I would call theoretical historical question. What are the different effects that follow from these different styles of teaching? What different conceptions of knowledge, learning, and politics does each presume and produce? Might there be elements of thinking that are more available to one style or the other? Or even more concretely, do these different styles lend themselves more readily to particular contents? For instance, it's with the founding of schools that the emergence of distinctive disciplines occurs. One suspects that this isn't a mere coincidence. So in any case, I'd like to use this historical image which emphasizes physical movement in order to move toward a somewhat more abstract conception of itineration, one that moves away from the recognizably physical sense of wandering that constitutes it, and moves toward considering different styles of what we could provisionally call thinking. So I'm interested in itinerant thinking, or thinking as itineration. For this, we could, I would turn to the distinction that Deleuze and Guattari make in A Thousand Plateaus between what they call royal science and itinerant or nomad sciences. This is, I think, page 372. A distinction must be made between two types of sciences or scientific procedures. One consists in reproducing, the other in following. The first involves reproduction, iteration, reiteration. And be careful to emphasize this is not iteration in their no sense. <laughs> okay. um, so reproduction, iteration, reiteration. The other involving itineration is the sum of the ambulant sciences. The ideal of reproduction, deduction, or induction is part of royal science, and it treats differences in time and place as so many variables, the constant form of which is extracted precisely by the law. Reproducing implies the permanence of a fixed point of view that is external to what is reproduced, watching the flow from the bank. But following is something different from the ideal of reproduction. Not better, just different. This is still uh, Deleuze and Guattari. One is obliged to follow when one is in search of the singularities of a matter, or rather of a material, and not out to discover a form. When one engages in a continuous variation of the variables, 
instead of ex extracting constants from them. Here, Deleuze and Guattari are diagnosing what I, what I think is not simply an epistemological difference, although they frame it as such, but I, I would, a deeper what I would call, really, you know, for lack of a better word, an ethical difference. And by this I mean I think we're dealing not so much with different ways of knowing, but with different fundamental orientations to the world, one of which involves the extraction of constants in which space-time is figured as external secondary variables. The other, itineration, involves an immersive extraction of variation in which space-time is constitutive of the encounter itself. But what does this exactly mean? <laughs> one of the ways that I've tried to understand this is by thinking about a distinction between what I would loosely characterize, and I don't want to go back for these terms, but I would loosely characterize as a communicative relation to language and a rhetorical relation to language. So obviously I'm in the field of rhetoric, so <laughs> I have an investment in one of these terms, right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, although this point is usually overlooked in today's scholarship, I would want to argue that rhetoric's traditional emphasis on persuasion means it is not identical to practices that emphasize the central role of understanding. Here's what I mean. An act of communication attempts to transmit the proposition through understanding. It endeavors to reproduce, as accurately as possible, the proposition in the mind of the audience. Hence, communication responds to the proposition as if that proposition were primarily a meaning, as if it were, above all, an identifiable content that can be reproduced. In this sense, communication is fundamentally a signifying operation, one that envisions the proposition as a meaning, signified content, and attempts to reproduce that meaning for another person's understanding. Persuasion, on the other hand, works through a different relation to language. Rather than attempt to identically reproduce the proposition as a meaning in the mind of the audience, persuasive rhetoric attempts to make the proposition compelling, to give it a certain force. That is, persuasion responds to the proposition not so much as an identifiable content or meaning, but in terms of its capacity to exert a compelling force, its ability to evoke a particular response. Persuasion, then, we would say, is asignified. It is not primarily interested in what the, preposition, what the proposition is, or what it means, or with the entire communicative apparatus that follows from this. Instead, it emphasizes what the proposition does. Even in the most traditional, subject-centered version of rhetoric, if I'm trying to persuade you, I am primarily interested in getting you to do something, rather than to understand something. At its limit, you don't even need to understand what I want you to do, just so long as you do it. Case. But, you know, it's the same time, it's, you're right, it's crucial not to imply a rigid either-or distinction here either. Uh, no doubt, persuasion often includes the movement of understanding as one of its strategies. And you could even say, certainly, that in the traditional diagram of, you know, managerial rhetoric, where I'm trying to convince you or persuade you of something, that in that, in that diagram, subject-centered persuasion, understanding is a crucial element, at least insofar as I need to understand what I'm trying to persuade you of, right? It's yeah. so, so in that diagram, right. it's, it's, the it's the starting point, in a sense, yeah. right? I need to understand in order to, uh, in order to do something else to you. you don't need to understand, right? what it is that I'm trying but to... But if you're going to try to persuade... You but I need to, at least. Yeah. So, but nevertheless, I mean, I, I, I think... Uh, I mean, for that reason, I, I feel like it's better to talk about them as, like, um, as different inclinations that coexist in any actual right. encounter. Gotcha. Um, so, but, but the fact that they exist in close proximity, right, doesn't mean that they're the same. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, what I want to emphasize here is the quality of these two different styles of response that are two different inclinations within any particular encounter with the world. So here are the example I've been using as an encounter with language or a proposition or an idea, I and mean, that's what I've been using. But you might just as easily apply these dynamics to an encounter with, say, the idea of itineration, uh, or an encounter with another person, or an animal, or, you know, furniture, or plants. So, in terms of the idea, just to keep it in terms of the idea, communication, as the orientation that, that Deleuze and Guattari characterizes as that of world science, it responds to the idea as if, as if the idea is a particular content and a meaning. So what we could do, we could summarize this by saying the particular style of encounter 
that characterizes that is that it encounters the other as a recognizable identity in terms of what or who the other is. So the who and is, who is it, is the central question of the royal sciences, or what is it, is the right. central question. So, it re and that's a response to the other that works through an extraction of constants and, I would emphasize, a logic of identity. So this is an inclination within any particular encounter towards meaning, things, content. On the other hand, the a-signifying encounter with an idea doesn't primarily circulate through around recognizable identities. Think of traditional persuasion's response to the proposition. Rather than encountering it as a content, it encounters this content as nothing other than a constellation of forces. Rather than orienting toward an identifiable who or what, this inclination orients itself toward the singularity that comprises any particular who or what. It doesn't ask who or what is it, but instead asks what can it do? It's a different fundamental orientation or, or question. But to concretize this even further, I just want to consider the task that we're engaged in here, or that I'm engaged in here, I guess. <laughs> Okay, I'm talking to the, them, not you there. So the task that I'm engaged in here, and that's to introduce you to an idea, the idea of itineration. But, it, you know, it could be any idea. So there are just fundamentally different ways of undertaking that task. I could, as I have largely done, try to explain it to you, try to help you understand it. This is the communicative inclination, the orientation of royal sciences, which responds to the idea, even the idea of itineration, as if it's a content to be communicated to your understanding. I could, conversely, try to do something with it, to perform it, to see where it can go. Uh, to use the traditional human language, I could, humanist language, the traditional human language. <laughs> to use the traditional humanist language, I, I, could, uh, I could do something inspired by the idea of, of itineration. And that's, you know, that's what you've done <laughs> and, yeah. and you're doing. Um, that's Brian Harmon, by the way, <laughs> the video guru. Um, so it responds to the idea as a constellation of forces. Um, it is deeply imprecise to suggest that one can simply distinguish between these two inclinations as if they were merely two recognizable identities with royal science on the one hand and itineration on the other. It is not the case that the explanatory and performative inclinations are pure poles that merely blend together in actual practice, right? So it's, it's not a hybrid. I mean, everybody loves hybrids, I guess, especially these days, the, the, you know, gas guzzling cars. But, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not Way simply to get political. an issue of saying, <laughs> yes, it's not simply an issue of hybridity here that they blend in practice. Instead, I think of them really as different rhythms of encounter or, I would say, different wavelengths of alterity. Hmm. That's it. That's all I got. Um, and so if you think of these things as different speeds of an encounter, that there are elements of, again, it's not a blending, it's not medium speed. There are slow moments and there are fast moments, right? There are, there are moments of itineration and there are moments of royal sign. I mean, again, moments seems too imprecise. Yeah. But we're talking about speeds of an encounter. Um, and so, or, 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 you know, the rhythmic, the rhythm quality would be the oscillation of the speed. So when you talk about an inclination, you would say, like, look, there's more of an inclination. What I'm doing here, in, in what I'm doing, is I'm trying to explain something to you and to me. Right? I'm trying to, in, the, in this, this, the, the bad sense, right? It's, I'm not doing itineration in that sense. But, but of course I am, right? But of course, the only way that I can explain is by connecting different things that occur to me, that occur to you, that occur video, you know? So it, it's, it's absurd to think that, that, that there's an absence of an itinerative quality. Mm. Nevertheless, I would say the rhythm of this kind of encounter is something that's different from the rhythm of, for instance, what you were doing, mm. right? So, or what you're doing in this conjunction, which is not trying to explain to future viewers, you're trying to provoke, or trying, I mean, you're responding to this content as a constellation of forces. Whatever that means, constellation of forces means. Just think about this, like, when I say, does that make sense, I'm asking a very particular kind of question. Like, there's a difference between saying, does that make sense, and, and saying something like, does that resonate? I mean, those are different experiences, which is one is getting your head around something, and that's something. That's, it's not affectless, but 
there are different ways of, of getting things, you know, that, that you can get the losing guitar without being able to, you can get anybody without being able to explain them. Yeah. Explaining is one thing. Now, obviously, it's something that we value in all kinds of uh, ways and, and is useful for all kinds of itinerative practices, you know. But it's, it's I mean, what, I, what interests me about itineration is that it offers, again, I, I feel as if it offers a concrete practice of inspiration. That's what I would, I mean, if you want to say it in those terms, like, I don't like the word inspiration, um, but when you say inspired by, you know, it's inspired in that sense of like, the film is inspired by that side too. That's all good. They're definitely laughing. Okay, so when the, when the, when the dog jumps in, there's a central component of the concept yeah, yeah. of itineration is that the possibility that a dog might jump on your lap. There you so, go. <laughs> um, it's a nomad dog for sure. A desert dog. <laughs> it's a definite desert dog. <laughs> <laughs> what the? <laughs> Sit. Sit. Good boy. Sit. <laughs>